Okay, should be live. Hopefully everything's working. If anyone is here, can you confirm me? Can you hear me? Excellent, thank you for confirming, Carlos. So, uh, as you can see, uh, I only have one display, so uh, it's gonna be a doozy. <laughs> but I think we should wait for like uh, five more minutes to see if uh, anyone else is gonna arrive. It's weird having only one display, but second one should be coming hopefully shortly. Right then, so I think we should uh, we should start. If anyone else wants to join, I'll have uh, <coughs> I'll have different sections where I'll answer any questions which you guys might have. So I hope everything is fine uh, and you can hear me well. Uh, so I will commit to my very first live stream on uh, music composition. Uh, sort of music composition in a way. Today we're going to talk about uh, orchestration and what I mean by orchestration is we're going to learn how how uh, an orchestra functions basically, what, uh, what the main components of an orchestra are instrument-wise and uh, <coughs> how they function and what uh, range each instrument has. So the topics of discussion will be we're going to start off with scientific pitch notation which uh, sounds more fancy than it actually is. Then we're going to talk about bowed instruments or strings. You might uh, encounter them named as strings. Violin, viola, cello and double bass. Woodwinds, uh, brass, harps, 
keyboard instruments, percussion instruments of both definite and indefinite pitch because yeah you can have different percussion instruments that actually put out notes and then we're gonna talk a little bit about timbre and textures mixing and mastering pointers and software and uh, creating a small song we're gonna basically see how um, everything uh, functions uh, how we can use different VSTs in Reaper to create a song using only uh, orchestral instruments now scientific pitch notation is um, it's a bit technical but it's important because uh, it's gonna be important when we talk about the range of each instrument so uh, each sound we produce has a certain frequency associated to it. Uh, the frequency determines some technical aspects which we're not going to discuss because not, uh, not all of them are important. But what you need to remember is that the higher you hear a note, the higher a note is to the human ear, then the higher the frequency of that note is. From now on we're going to refer to <coughs> that aspect as the pitch of the note. The pitch is basically the how it's something that uh, some people of a couple of hundred years ago I think created in order to have a more uh, a simpler association to the whole frequency thing because uh, it's using frequency was a bit complicated so uh, basically we can hear uh, sounds from anywhere between 20 Hertz and 20 kilohertz where Hertz is the measuring unit for frequency and uh, as a result, uh, for each, uh, for these um, these values, you can create a total of uh, 10 or so octaves. Uh, as, uh, <coughs> as a general idea, an octave is the place where a frequency of a note basically doubles or halves its value. Uh, the easiest way you can do this on guitar is uh, if you play the A string third fret, it's going to produce a C note and if you also play uh, the G string on the fifth fret it will also produce a G note but uh, the second G note is going to be of a higher pitch uh, or more precisely it's going to be an octave higher uh, given this uh, this array of frequency values there are like ten and a half octaves I believe uh, with the middle octave being the fourth one because notation starts from zero so the first octave is actually the zero octave from C0 to B0 uh, pitch wise the middle C or C4 as you can see there is located on the B string first fret pitch wise anyway because if you ever read a musical sheet for guitar you'll have noticed that uh, you're you're supposed to play the um, the C note located on the A string uh, third fret which is basically the C3 in terms of pitch it's another discussion for another day this one so basically the scientific pitch is uh, obtained by taking a note name and uh, putting the octave the octave number next to it as you can see here we have the C4 the C4 as an example okay and now that uh, we have this going we can start off with uh, the first section of uh, orchestral instruments uh, and uh, that is the bowed instruments the possibly the most well-known instrument of this uh, category is the violin which has uh, quite a big range of notes it can go from G3 to E7 or for certain um, for certain other uh, there are certain violins that can go even higher up to B7 as you can see it has uh, four strings and uh, from uh, left to right the tuning is G D A E it's G3 uh, D4 A4 and E5 to be precise out of all the strings it is the highest sounding one it's uh, usually used for solos but it can be used for sustaining parts or rhythm parts if you will as well as for its register the bottom range of notes approximately from G3 to B4 so to speak 
is a bit dark sounding uh, not necessarily menacing but you know has that sort of sort of uh, edge darkness to it the middle range on the other hand is a bit warmer and that's where you, you'll usually hear uh, notes the middle and the upper range depending uh, depending of course on what the part of the song is meant to be if it's a solo part then yeah you will find yourself usually located in the middle range or the high range if uh, the violinist is supposed to sustain uh, a section of a song uh, most likely he'll uh, end up in the bottom range because uh, the middle range and higher range tend to be more piercing they tend to overshadow other instruments uh, so to speak next in line is the viola uh, the viola has a different sounding range it's from C3 to A6 it's a bit lower and uh, as you can see it looks fairly similar to the violin and uh, it also has four strings from left to right the tuning is C, G, D and A from C3 to A5 to be precise it's the second highest sounding bowed instrument not really used for solos it, it's, it's mostly used for sustaining it, for rhythm if you will uh, as for the register it's uh, since it's very similar to the violin it's going to sound pretty much like a violin but a bit darker or harsher depending on the notes of course the notes that can be played on the C string uh, are somber so to speak they, uh, they tend to invoke a bit of sadness the, G, the notes uh, played on the G string uh, from I don't really know exactly the range but basically you can look at these notes as uh, from G4 from uh, G3 to G4 so to speak they sound fuller but a bit darker the D string notes are darker and weaker but they feel a bit warmer and the A string notes uh, are bright and brilliant though they do tend to get a bit more nasal depending on uh, depending on the notes so to speak However, viola being mainly used for sustaining, it's not really a very piercing instrument. I don't really know that many orchestras that actually have viola solos. You can find many that have violin solos though. Uh, so yeah, there is that. Let me just check for a bit to see if anyone has said anything in the chat. Yes, Ed. Yes, the GDA is from uh, low to high. The um, uh, the tuning is from the left string to the right string similar to guitar basically so the highest string is the E it goes th the, uh, the go then goes down to A and then D and G it's sort of a reverse guitar so to speak okay let's uh, move on shall we to the cello the cello uh, is the second lowest sounding bowed instrument uh, the range is actually an octave lower than the than the viola as you can see it's from C2 to A5 and the tuning is basically the same as the viola but an octave lower uh, it can be used for solos if you're part of the band two cellos uh, but it's mostly used for sustaining and I think there's also a bit of a solo in uh, a cello solo in uh, uh, that One Republic song uh, the secret song I'm gonna give all my secrets away or whatever I think that's a, also a cello solo uh, one uh, thing to remember is that um, the l sort of lower or bigger you go with these instruments the lower you go uh, the strings tend to be a bit uh, a bit thicker since they have to produce uh, lower sounds kind of like the guitar in that regard and uh, the register for the cello is uh, as you, it's as you can see here the notes that are played on the C string are very rich sounding because uh, since the since the string tends to be a bit thicker also the note is uh, is going to have a much uh, fuller sound the G string notes uh, are warmer of course because you're starting to hit that uh, mellow register of the cello the D string notes are uh, as some have described it lush and captivating and uh, the A string notes, the high A string notes, are uh, very brilliant and piercing. 
uh, one thing you have to be careful with uh, strings is that the higher you go the um, the more not necessarily bright the but piercing i think is the correct word the the notes become ever more piercing and uh, depending on uh, depending on what string instrument you use it might not be in its advantage for example I can firmly say that playing uh, notes that are way too high in the cello will make it sound uh, like you're depending on how good you are it may sound like you're uh, you're very good or you're strangling the poor thing it all well, it all depends on how good you are that's why for the that's why I recommend if you plan on using the cello I usually usually use it only for sustaining because it has that uh, very strong uh, uh, low and middle uh, low and middle registers that can help with uh, sustaining the notes. And finally we reach the double bass, the lowest sounding bowed instrument. If it helps you can uh, view it as the equivalent of uh, the electric bass the electric bass in the in a rock band. The range is from E1 to G4. It can actually be extended to C1 G4 so even lower. Uh, the four the four strings are tuned uh, somewhat similar to a guitar. So uh, the lowest string is E, the next one is A, uh, followed by D and G. If I remember correctly, Sting actually plays this thing in uh, every breath you take. Uh, it's basically used to, to serve as the bass part in the songs, be it uh, to, f to build up chords or uh, yeah, mostly you'll see uh, double bass is used for the bass parts and uh, sustaining the lower notes of chords. Because uh, the funny thing about chords in orchestras is that you can't really play a chord on a single uh, instrument. So if you want to play a chord consisting of three notes, say C, E, G, a C major chord, you actually have to have uh, three different uh, players. One, one playing the C note, one playing the E note, and one playing the G note. Hence why uh, I said that uh, double basses are usually used to sustain the lower note of a chord, just so there's no confusion. Uh, basically, the double bass is meant to uh, to be used in the in its very low registers. Uh, hence why the A and uh, A E string notes and A string notes are the ones that you'll end up using the most. You can also use the D string notes, but uh, be careful that when the higher you go, uh, you're gonna sound a bit harsh. The sound is going to become a bit harsher, for the same reason as above. It's not really meant to play really, really high notes, but to each his own, I guess. Before we move on uh, to woodwinds, uh, let's talk about some playing techniques for these instruments. Most commonly, they they will use the bow thingy, and uh, the bow is basically this one. It's uh, it's been used to some somewhat good success by uh, our fellow guitarist Jimmy Page in a uh, whole lot of love. Before the actual solo begins, that is, there is that whoosh sound that's actually obtained by Jimmy Page playing the guitar with a bow but yeah and uh, another common technique is is, is called uh, pizzicato it's uh, s instead of playing with the bow itself you actually pick the strings with your fingers somewhat like you would do on a guitar it's uh, very useful for staccato notes and uh, for that added effect it's also useful if you want to Pizzicato, I, I feel, uh, adds a bit of um, of attention to a certain note because it's if it's only, you know, I, I'm going to say picked because that's what you do. It uh, tends to grab, uh, grab the listener's attention a tad more. Now, again, since I don't have two displays, let's check out the live chat to see if anyone has any questions. Almost forgot. Well, I'm glad you didn't. I don't know exactly who you are, but I'm glad you are here. Now, uh, let's move on to... Oh, yeah, I misled you. Before woodwinds, we're going to talk about harps. Harps are... Uh, 
basically I think it's the largest instrument I think only beaten by the piano in an orchestra uh, as you can see it has uh, ah crap I, I forgot to remove the tuning uh, the harp is uh, basically this here no I'm not uh, doing uh, commercials for Guinness beer don't worry it has uh, 47 strings and yeah if I was a university teacher I'd actually do a Romero and uh, uh, specify each string tuning I that's I, I don't really remember them what you need to remember is that uh, the tuning is from C flat 1 to G G sharp 7 it's uh, I think only the piano beats it in range if I remember correctly and uh, what you want to do with uh, a harp is uh, mostly based on w what uh, sort of feeling you want to uh, to transmit in your songs uh, I've actually used the harp in one of my or orchestral covers uh, the stage to be exact in the middle part and uh, what you want to remember is that uh, the lower uh, the lower octaves are uh, full and dark sounding however the middle two octaves and the higher you go the brighter the sound uh, becomes the middle two octaves actually sound warm they uh, they give that very peaceful f peaceful feeling and in the highest two octaves the the harp becomes very brilliant and bright sounding almost piercing at times if you go too high so you need to remember that because uh, as you can see the strings tend to get a little bit shorter so the higher you go the more intense the more intense the sound will be it's usually used for uh, any and all times you want to invoke something ethereal or angelical uh, either that or I've watched too many cartoons where they were for exactly that but the harp can be used for creating such feelings uh, uh, such feelings in your music with uh, with uh, pretty good success okay now that we got that out of the way it's time to move on to the next section in the orchestra which is the woodwinds if I remember correctly the name woodwind s uh, originates from the fact that these instruments were originally made from wood and in order to produce sound you had to blow air in them so wind had to uh, move through them hence woodwind as you can see uh, present-day woodwinds uh, are mostly made of metal so make of that what you will uh, the flute is uh, quite a commonly used uh, woodwind it has uh, quite a large range it's mostly used for higher registers though as you can see uh, the first note of the range is B3 and you can go up to D7 uh, pitch wise let me think about it this translates on a guitar so it starts on the on the open B string that's B3 pitch wise on your guitar and B7 is uh, way way over what the uh, standard tune guitar can go if I yeah it's uh, it's way over that uh, basically what d7 represents so you have a general idea of it we're gonna go through some uh, examples some song examples and uh, range examples uh, when we do the song so don't worry about it the d7 is basically if you played if you played a, a d note on the thin e string on the 22nd fret that's a d6 pitch wise so think of it as going to be an octave higher than that so you have a general idea uh, register wise uh, it's a pretty mellow sounding instrument and uh, at least in the lower registers it's it ranges from uh, luscious and sweet to brilliant in uh, a5 g6 and it actually becomes quite piercing and shrill in the in the higher octaves and as I've mentioned here, I think this is the instrument that plays in November rain exactly before the lyrics begin. It's either that or a piccolo. I don't remember exactly which one, but it's one of these two. Speaking of um, piccolo, let me check the live stream for a bit.
Oh, okay. <laughs> it's Calvin. I see. I see. Thanks for being here, man. Much appreciated. Now, uh, Piccolo. And yes, for any and all Dragon Ball fans out there, this is where Piccolo's name actually originates. Some people might say it's from the pickle word, but it's not. It's literally based on this instrument since his uh, children, I guess, whatever, are named drum, tambourine, and cymbal. Uh, funnily enough, though, this uh, naming convention was dropped for other Namekians and Dragon Ball, but, you know, whatever. Uh, Range-wise, the piccolo tends to be a bit... Uh, it's ac it goes actually a bit higher than uh, than the flute, though they're from the same family, as we'll learn a bit later. And, uh, yeah, the register characteristics, characteristics are basically the same. The only difference is the octaves to which you have to apply this. Uh, the piccolo and flute are, uh, most of the times, they're used together, as uh, we'll learn uh, in a bit. Now, the oboe, the one that Mr. Heckles was playing in Friends, allegedly. Uh, it's, we're, uh, it's a bit lower sounding, uh, though it uh, can be used for solos. Or it actually has a very mellow sound, so it uh, can be used for solos without uh, tiring the listener's ear. It ranges from B flat three to G six, which uh, which I think you can actually somewhat play this on the guitar, uh, at least for at least up until D six anyway. B flat three is basically the G string third fret, pitch wise, and G six extends past the range of a standard guitar. Uh, register characteristics are. Uh, a bit uh, mellower than uh, flute and oboes because um, being that it's a somewhat larger woodwind it uh, adds a bit of overtones it, ha it adds some overtones that uh, mellow uh, that mellow the sound a bit uh, as you can see the register characteristics uh, vary uh, based on uh, octaves uh, i usually recommend using it up until e6 because the sound is warmer uh, F6 and G6 tend to be a bit uh, piercing and pinched, so to speak, so not really the strong suit of an oboe. But again, it all depends on you. The English horn, uh, not to be confused with the French horn that comes later, uh, is, as you can see, it's somewhat similar, but a bit lower in range than uh, than the oboe. It goes from E3 to C6. This one you can actually, uh, we can actually play on guitar. So the E3 is basically the D string second fret, and C6 is the E string, the thin E string uh, 20th fret. Uh, that's the range. And uh, it's, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, the English horn and the oboe are part of the same sort of family of instruments. And as a result, their registers are uh, basically the same, only the only difference, of course, being the octaves, the register characteristics. However, some uh, recommendation I have is that you should try to, exp uh, to exploit the lower registers for this one because, uh, uh, because it helps. It uh, provides, um, a <coughs> it's basically the strong sort of the instrument. The clarinet, the clarinet is, uh, I don't know, uh, up until I heard the clarinet for the first time, I couldn't actually associate it to it. It's one. Of, it's actually one of the main characteristics of this instrument. It's really unobtrusive, to the point where you don't really know what to associate it with. However, uh, it's uh, fairly useful in uh, both the lower and especially in the middle registers, because while it may sound a bit unobtrusive and a bit uh, lackluster in the first two registers there, it becomes surprisingly useful and surprisingly uh, good in the higher registers, especially in the A4 B flat 5 range, with a bit of B5 G6 added to it. Of course, it becomes surprisingly surprisingly strong in that in those registers. Uh, it can be used for solos, I think, but I haven't really seen it that much. And unless you're a Squidward fan, well, you know. The bass clarinet or bass clarinet is uh, somewhat, 
equivalent-ish to a cello range-wise and uh, it's mostly used for uh, sustaining especially low and middle note uh, co uh, middle chord notes because as you can see the register is a bit uh, lower we're uh, getting close to the double bass register uh, the first part the first octave and a half is dark sounding from d flat to to f3 uh, we move on to a brighter sound though in uh, the middle register up until f4 and uh, it kind of loses its edge in the um, in the higher register though i mean it gets overshadowed by other instruments who have uh, stronger registers between those notes the bassoon is uh, is actually not the lowest sounding uh, woodwind instrument if you believe it has actually has uh, quite of a quite of a range for it even though it's mostly mostly used for uh, uh, bass and uh, note sustaining especially in chords though it does have a sweet spot in the a to d4 range uh, you really want to use it in the in the lower registers the first two rangers there because uh, in the higher registers it's going to get overshadowed by uh, other woodwinds or uh, other strings it's, it's not going to it, it's going to get lost in the mix so to speak and the contrabassoon uh it's basically similar to the double bass in range and purpose it's meant to uh, to sustain the lower notes in a chord and to provide uh, any and all uh, bass notes basically bass lines and uh, it's from the same family as the bassoon but only it sounds lower uh, you really have to make sure that you exploit the lower registers for this one from b flat zero to i don't really know basically a maximum of b flat one or c2 because uh any higher than that they'll get um they'll get overshadowed by uh, either the bassoon or the clarinet or especially or other instruments such as the cello or uh, double bass and that about covers it for woodwinds let's do a check on any and all other comments Am I making everything clear? Do you have any questions? I can pause for a bit if you have any questions, so uh, I can answer them right now. Because I've uh, gone through a lot of info and uh, I'm sure you have some questions. I'll wait for like two minutes to rehydrate myself. And if you have anything to ask, feel free to do so. Note that I, there might be a small delay between uh, when you type the question and when I see it, so if I don't answer immediately, uh, just so you know why. In the meantime, how is uh, how is everyone's day going? How is this whole lockdown thing? Uh, how is this whole lockdown thing treating you? I mean, I've been working from home remotely. Uh, God damn it! I've been working from home either partially or full time for like two years now, so it's not uh, not that big of a deal for me. But how's it uh, how's it going with you guys? Also, Calvin, I just noticed that you said you listened to my EP today. Much appreciate the comments and feedback. Ed, it's good that you don't have any questions. Either I'm so good at explaining this or extremely bad. Uh, <laughs> I guess we'll find out later. You know, some questions that I don't want answered right now. Right. Okay then. Uh, I'll check the live chat in a bit, 
if uh, you have any questions or comments or anything else I will read them and accept them with uh, with uh, doom guy like pride right uh, let's move on to the third section of an orchestra uh, which may or may not be present of course depending on the size of it and that is the brass uh, the brass what song should I use as an example for this oh of course you know how uh, in 2007 Avenged Sevenfold released their self-titled album and there was that uh, a short eight and a half minute song uh, written by our own uh, our own uh, reverend James Sullivan and uh, you can I think you can basically hear brass pretty well in that song uh, especially during the lyrics I don't exactly know I think it's mostly based on trombones or reeds I don't think exactly know I don't exactly know I haven't watched it in a while so I don't want to lead you astray but that's a very good use of brass uh, brass elements and the highest uh, not necessarily highest but the possibly the most common one uh, and the most well-known one is the trumpet uh, you actually have two types of trumpets and uh, their range is different as a result I think it all it has to do with uh, I don't I don't exactly know what influences the range for the trumpet but uh, you can have two types of trumpets they both end on C6 though which again is the E string 20th fret the thin E string the only difference is that uh, the B flat trumpet actually uh, starts at E3 while the C trumpet starts at F sharp 3 uh, the register is somewhat similar of course now the synth trumpet uh, though sounds brighter I mean uh, it, it it can pierce through other instrumentals easier uh, however the B flat trumpet sounds richer or a bit mellower so it won't uh, pierce through the orchestra as easy but it will sound uh, mellower and fuller uh, the ranges from the trumpet are described as follows and I can honestly agree with F sharp 3 B3 it's really bland it doesn't uh, really do it doesn't really do the trumpet justice however when you start going through C4 and A5 it uh, actually starts uh, becoming really really strong and I think that's the sweet spot of it uh, any uh, any higher it will again it will pierce to the orchestra but it depending on um, depending on what type of sound you're writing it may be a bit too harsh so uh, you can basically use it in a in moments of crescendo in a song where uh, you have to raise the volume or the intensity of the song because it's going to be pretty good there Lou Begg actually uses it effectively in his Mambo number no. 5 song he even gives a shout out to the trumpet if I remember correctly so yeah uh, the next one you'll uh, you'll basically encounter it under two names either simply a horn uh, but since that's confusing I'll let you know that the second name of it is the French horn this is the French horn it's totally unrelated to the English horn uh, it has uh, it has a lower register than the trumpet uh, it can be used for solos uh, especially if your if your solos range from G3 to B4 or higher than that but it can also be used for um, for sustaining or for chords uh, the higher notes or even the lower notes if you want to have a darker feeling because it uh, has quite a big range and you can go to to low to low notes quite easily the trombone uh, the trombone is uh, that guy from Whiplash's worst nightmare. You can actually have two two types of trombones: the tenor trombone, which can be used for soloing, as as the name tenor suggests, and the bass trombone, which is mostly used for uh, sustaining rhythm or uh, otherwise chord notes. Uh, haven't uh, haven't encountered trombones too much because I did again before 
<laughs> before uh, doing an orchestration course, I didn't really know how to associate it to a song. But it uh, starts off as a very dark sounding instrument. It becomes strong and intense, I'll, I'll give them that, as, the, as you reach the higher notes. Uh, it can be used. Uh, I think it can be used quite well with the trumpet or the French horns, since from the since they're from the same family, so to speak. And the tuba is the it's the lowest sounding brass instrument, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, its uh, its strong points are in the lower registers, as uh, either bass lines, uh, like a regular electric bass, but sang on the tuba. It uh, sounds a bit weaker in the higher registers though, so I don't really recommend uh, using those notes for it. And before we move on to percussion with definite pitch or otherwise drums that produce notes, let's see if you guys have any other comments. Oh, I, I understand that feeling, Ed. <laughs> I actually quite understand it. Uh, what can you do? Oh well, it'd be like that sometimes. So yeah, percussion with definite pitch. You can actually have a drum that produces notes, uh, to my surprise. It's called the timpani. Uh, it, has a, it has a small range of notes though. It's uh, mainly used to accentuate uh, the lower notes of a chord. Uh, its range can be extended all the way to C4, but it's not really going to sound that good, uh, that high. Uh, I mean, technically you only extend it by two notes though, so it's not much of a difference, but uh, the sweet spot is any anywhere between D2 and uh, D3, I think. It starts to lose, uh, to lose its luster uh, the more you reach the high range. I actually used it uh, in, a, in my songs, uh, we'll get to that later. You can play it uh, in, a, in two different ways. You can either uh, you can either you can use the mallet to do a single note like doom, like you would a uh, regular drum, or you can use two mallets and do drum rolls to sustain a note. Uh, when you sustain notes like this, when you do drum rolls, it uh, gives a sense of urgency, like uh, you're supposed to. It gives a feeling of rush of rushness to the song. So it all depends on you, on what you want to achieve. The xylophone, uh, one of the one of the instruments used uh, in many and all cartoons I've watched when I was little. For some reason, people always love to play the xylophone. Its uh, its sound uh, will get to how it sounds uh, to sound examples later, so don't worry. But basically, it's very wood wood like sounding. It's very woody. Ish, because basically, if I remember correctly, the the keys that you play are actually made of wood, but they can produce notes or something. I don't exactly know the material, but the sound is somewhat like you are playing pieces of wood that produce notes. The uh, the xylophone is meant for higher ranges, as you can see. It's uh, you can go from C5 to all the way to C8, which is the highest note on the piano, by the way. And uh, or C4 to C8, you can actually go f uh, a bit lower. And uh, yeah, the xylophone excels in the higher range when it becomes brighter. It's uh, usually used in songs to inf reinforce the melody. It uh, doubles the main melody of the song to add uh, to add a bit of reinforcement to it. The marimba is uh, another xylophone-ish like instrument as you can see. Uh, however, this one uh, as opposed to the xylophone is usually meant for uh, for the lower registers because uh, because it excels in that and uh, the upper registers basically sound a lot like a xylophone so if you have a xylophone it's pointless to play to play them both in the high registers since they're gonna sound the same. We now move on to what is undoubtedly my favorite of these uh, of these instruments, of these percussion instruments with definite pitch, the glockenspiel. The glockenspiel is, uh, you know, that uh, almost bell like sound you hear in all Christmas commercials? Yeah, that's the glockenspiel. It, it's 
very useful for creating a festive atmosphere. It's uh, w the first time I actually uh, actually realized, I realized how much I like this instrument was um, in uh, Wake Me Up When September Ends, if you believe, by Green Day. Uh, I think when the distortion guitar starts to kick in, uh, you hear some bright sounds that uh, double the chord, you know? So after the first Wake Me Up With September ends on Distorts Guitar, you can also hear like a very bright sound uh, in the songs. That's the glockenspiel. We'll, uh, we'll see how it sounds when uh, we get to the song examples, but if you, I hope you know what I'm talking about so you have a basic idea. The, fib the vibraphone is a... Uh, somewhat uh, something in between a xylophone or glockenspiel but in the lower ranges uh, lower ranges as you can see it's uh, not that widely used it, i think it was uh, uh, it was invented li quite late quite late if i remember correctly some i mean these uh, the other instruments that i've i've been talking about they date all the way back to 1700 or whenever the uh, whenever the classical the classical musician period started, while the vibraphone I think was invented some sometime in nineteen after nineteen hundred, so yeah, it didn't really catch on that much. It uh, sounds a bit. Uh, I don't even think I've I've used it in any songs, but it sounds a bit uh, outer space like. I don't really know how to describe it better than that. Yeah, and now we move on to the tubular bells. The tubular bells are um, are uh, yeah, they are the ones that Mike Oldfield uses in his tubular bell song, and uh, they actually they actually have a very very rich sound as you can hear in that song. Uh, their range is not that big though, as you can see, it uh, ranges from C4 to F5. It can go as uh, low as as high as G5 and as low as F3 with some tweaks or you know adding some extra tubes. They're generally used to create. Uh, they're generally used alongside uh, other instruments to create uh, a festive-like atmosphere. Again, I think they can be used to quite a bit of success in any and all Christmas commercials or songs because they they add a, a very festive atmosphere to them. Uh, the percussions of indefinite pitch, I've only mentioned them here. Uh, they're very, very similar to uh, a basic drum kit. You have a snare drum, a bass drum, a tambourine, and cymbals. Uh, they can be used to reinforce certain bass notes or in any metal songs, basically. The tambourine can be used with uh, the glockenspiel and other instruments. And the cymbals, again, they can be used to accentuate or, uh, you know, Otherwise, wake up uh, the listeners. Let's see. Before we move to keyboards, let's see if anyone has any questions. Oh, I'm gonna give myself a, another hydration break. So, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask them now. Uh, talking for 48 minutes and 38 seconds, as YouTube is showing me right now, is uh, it is kind of taking the toll on my uh, on my voice. Doesn't really help that I sang a bit earlier. Uh, okay. All right, so we're good to go. Okay. Let's, I'll uh, check up on you guys uh, in a bit, don't you worry. We mo now move on to keyboards. Everybody, or almost everybody, knows the piano. It's uh, 
I think the instrument that allows you the highest range of notes because it can go from as low as uh, A0 to as high as C8. I don't really think there is any other instrument that uh, allows you to go higher than C8. It's mostly used for soloing. Uh, there are actually entire concerts uh, made specifically for the piano, which I always found is a giant fat lie. <laughs> because uh, I've seen this uh, like 45 minute concert for piano written by Beethoven and I think the piano only starts after like five minutes after a, a, new, a new overture I think is the word played on strings I don't know it's uh, <laughs> I always found that funny but yeah it's uh, mostly used for soloing especially in orchestras uh, you can also have something called chamber music, where um, uh, it's basically like a very, very, very small version of an orchestra when you have like, I think a maximum of four or five instruments. Actually played chamber music when I was doing my musical studies. I was the piano, the piano guy, uh, the piano man as Billy Joel would put it. And I was accompanied or led by two violins. So yeah, I was... Uh, it was a bit of a, um, an interesting song because you had sections where the violins would uh, be the main part and sections where the piano was the main part, so there is that. The lower range is very full sounding, a bit, somb a bit somber actually and dark up until you reach uh, C3 and then it starts to mellow. The middle range is the mellow and warm sounding one up until G5 or A5 where it starts becoming very brighter very bright and the higher range becomes extremely bright uh, actually you can i don't even know how to describe this but the higher range on a piano sounds uh, sounds really cool it sounds like a glockenspiel but a bit mellower and uh, i always uh, i always a, a similar uh, i always consider the notes those notes that they were s had something like a breaking sound a break sound the broken sound but brighter sound and I, I don't know how to explain it uh, they're not very piercing though i mean they uh, it's actually funny because the the volume of these notes um, decreases as uh, you go higher which is uh, which is somewhat counterintuitive maybe that's so why you have to you have to re really be careful in the low ranges with your volume because the the lower notes on the piano have a very a very good resonance and they can overshadow the main melody if you're not careful uh the next in line i think the final instrument in in key in the keyboard section anyway is the celesta it's basically a smaller piano it's uh, it has a very ethereal sound heavenly almost like I'll show you an example of how to use how to use it uh, very well actually used it uh, it's usually used uh, in combination with the harp uh, if you want to have a, a soft section of a song that uh, gives you a peaceful attitude or vibe and in the higher registers it can uh, become a sort of a glockenspiel but a bit softer a bit mellower now that was all the instruments so um, before we move on to timber not the thing you yell when trees fall yeah uh, I'm gonna wait to see if you have any other questions or uh, I don't know insults comments <laughs> whatever you feel like saying What time is it where you guys are? Just out of curiosity, uh, where I'm from, in the land of choice, as some might, some might call it, the land of Romania, it's like 9.30 in the evening. I'm mostly curious at, <laughs> at the time zone difference to see if I should wish you a, pl a pleasant day ahead or good night when, uh, when we finish this.
Ah, Carlos, you're from UK. I see. Yeah. Did you have daylight savings yet? Because um, YouTube was adamant that uh, yesterday uh, my time zone was GMT plus three, and I'm fairly confident it's GMT plus two. I think it was a small difference because you didn't have daylight savings yet. Oh, so you have the whole day ahead of you, Ed. That's nice. Yeah, I always found this a bit confusing. Supposedly we were supposed to so we were supposed to like vote for what hour we choose starting from next year. I don't know what happened. I don't really care what happened. I can only hope that people will vote to keep the summer hours because it's uh, you have more natural daylight, but what can you do? <clears throat> okay. I think it's time to move on to what is known as timber oh. did i just print no, i don't want to print i want to go full screen god damn it right so uh the timber <coughs> is actually uh, the technical definition is the tone quality of an instrument and is determined by overtones uh, basically represents the unique sound whatever but <coughs> a simple <coughs> version of this a simple explanation is um, it's the it's the sound trait of an instrument. Like, you know, when you listen to a hundred guitarists, you'll immediately know which one of them is Sin Gates when he's playing. It's because of his tone. It's basically the tone of an instrument. The way you identify that uh, an instrument is a piano or a violin or uh, a viola, it goes the same for uh, voices as well. You always know when, uh, you always know who is, um, who is calling you when you when you already know when you have already heard his voice before so if your wife is calling you for whatever reason like start doing chores instead of doing live streams on youtube just a random example um i'll you'll know that she's the one calling because you've heard her voice before presumably you get what i'm saying so you have two types of timbers actually uh, the pure timber uh, which occurs when only a single inter instrument is playing so basically the you only have one instrument playing a section of a song and the composite timber which occurs when two or more instruments are playing the same notes yeah, that is actually important it actually occurs when you, two instruments are playing the same notes however the same notes can either be the same notes in the exact same octave or they can be the same notes e for example c d e f g but in a different octave hence why the composite timber has two subtypes the first one is called unison doubling uh, which occurs when uh, say a violin and a viola are playing the exact same notes and uh, octave doubling which occurs when say a violin and a viola are playing the same notes but one of them plays them higher or lower than the other instrument uh, the difference can be uh, of more than one octave as uh, we'll see a bit later now we move on to a uh, to an even more important uh, to an even more interesting uh, concept called texture uh, I'll try to break this down in something less uh, technical. So, basically, a texture is comprised of the many uh, m of all the elements that uh, make a song what it is. So, let's take a, a regular, a regular event seven four song since all of you are fans. So. For example, if we were to take almost easy the intro, you have uh, you have a bunch of stuff there going on. You have the drums, you have the piano, 
you also have the bass guitar and then you also have the rhythm guitar and then the lead guitar kicks in you have five different things and each uh, each of these contributes to creating the texture of the song it's basically all the elements that comprise the thing you're listening to at the moment now for uh, orchestral music you have a bunch of different textures uh, the monophonic texture is the first one since it's uh, it's the easiest to explain uh, it basically involves a single element or a single element of the song let's take the melody for example so a uh, melody with monophonic texture uh, uh, can be of uh, three different types all the instruments are playing the same notes in the same octaves it's actually pretty rare in orchestral music because uh, you don't it, because all the instruments blend tend to blend too much and don't really understand exactly what's going on but it does create a powerful statement when uh, the melody element of a song has like a violin, a viola, a flute, and a piccolo playing the same notes, so to speak, for, for example. Octave doubling uh, is actually far more common because it allows each instrument to to excel in its own range. So you can, you'll have a bunch of melodies where you'll have the main, mel the main notes that form the melody. Say you have a violin playing it for a bit and then uh, in order to add a bit of color as we'll uh, get to in the next slides you also introduce a second instrument let's say a uh, piccolo which can play higher notes than the violin can and uh, the piccolo instead of playing the notes that the violin is playing in the same octave it plays it in a it plays it in a in a higher octave that's uh, that's how you get a monophonic texture with octave doubling or a melody with octave doubling and parallel doubling god these things are so technical sometimes uh, basically parallel doubling is any dueling guitar in any metal music that's basically have a, a main melody played by one of the guitarists and um, you have uh, the rhythm guitarist or a second guitarist that uh, plays the exact same melody but an octave uh, but uh, a third or sixth higher usually third in uh, metal music in orchestral music you can see it in thirds and in sixth sixths god damn it that's a mouthful uh, a homophonic texture is um, another common one used uh, a homophonic texture occurs when you have uh, a melody played by an instrument, or usually a solo instrument, and the melody is played on top of a harmonic accompaniment. Uh, an example would be a piano solo, which is played on top of um, a, a rhythm or accompaniment, played on the violas and cellos or violins, and so on and so forth. Now, polyphonic texture is a... Uh, is uh, actually the more one of the more complex textures because because it occurs when you have two or more melodic lines that that are heard simu simultaneously. Uh, I don't have a a classical music example for this one. I do have a metal one or two. Uh, think of seize the day. Uh, especially the outro so you have the final chorus have a bit of a bridge between it and then uh, Matt Shadows starts singing the whole silence you lost me no chance for one more day he sings it two times and then he continues to sing that but on top of that uh, he also starts singing a different melodic line with the one with all I'm stuck here alone and on top of that you also have Sin playing his solo and on top of that you also have the rhythm part so it's basically a, a, you also have the rhythm part that you may or may not pay attention to this is also visible in Lost for a little bit again in the especially in the outro chorus the final chorus where you have uh, have the have Matt doing his vocals you have uh, 
the first lead guitar that was played over the first so the first choruses and you also have the first uh, solo that is played alongside that you have like three different melodies that you need to that you can pay attention to so yeah I, it's funny that i i'm talking about orchestration here and the best way i can explain it is with metal songs but yeah it'd be like that so so we're gonna finish this textures part, and if you have any questions, I'll be I'll answer I'll answer them afterwards. Uh, some more textures are mm, the chordal texture, which is basically a, a group of instruments playing a chord. As I mentioned in orchestras, you can't really have uh, uh, an instrument and a violin, a single violin player playing a chord. So you need like three of them, and that's how you get a chordal texture. And finally, we arrived to the complex texture, which is basically a combination of two or more textures that we have mentioned um, up until now. The most common one is the homophonic texture combined with the polyphonic one. And uh, one thing to, uh, to understand when you are using, when you are creating a song basically, is that any and all songs, be it orchestral or metal, have uh, three grounds, so to speak. You have the foreground, which is basically the main part of the song, uh, which is the one that the listener is paying attention to, uh, mostly. In uh, orchestras, it's basically whenever a violin or a piano or anyone does a solo part. And uh, you can also think of it as uh, the solos and lyrics parts in a metal song. The middle ground is... Uh, is the second layer as its name suggests it's not as loud as the foreground but uh, it's still meant to be heard I mean the listener will pay attention to it but not as much uh, it's usually the rhythm or accompaniment in songs and rhythm guitar or drums in uh, in metal songs and the background is the least prominent one uh, it's uh, usually reserved for instruments playing in the lower registers because um, those one those uh, those instruments don't really pierce through the orchestra because as sound works the lower sounds will get overshadowed by the higher sounding uh, the higher pitched sounds or notes it's just the law of music so to speak and any and all listeners follow uh, the parts of the song in the following order of course the the ones the part that is easiest to follow is the loudest part However, the second one is the most melodic part, so if a part is loud but someone is playing a really cool melody in the background, you may actually gra uh, grab the, the listener's attention. The highest part uh, is also quite, uh, quite uh, easy to follow because, uh, as I've said, high, high pitched sounds tend to sound to be, tend to be easy, easier to listen to and easier captured by the human ear. Also, the part with the most vivid or lively timbers is also um, uh, an ear catcher. And finally, uh, the user can also listen to the most active part. So basically, uh, what I'm trying to say is that you need to be careful what you need to be careful what what each instrument does because uh, while having a good foreground, middle ground, and background is ideal, you need to make sure that the middle ground does not overshadow the foreground. Uh, so to speak. The background is almost impossible to do it. I mean, it's cool to have uh, bits and pieces of uh, cool melody lines in the middle ground and background. You just need to make sure that they're not louder than uh, or louder or more melodical or higher or uh, more vivid than uh, what is meant to be the main part of a song. And now, uh, before we move on to how we combine instruments, I want to check if you guys have any questions. Yeah, I understand there's a delay. Uh, there's uh, like a delay for me here when uh, when I see your questions as well. So I think it's fine. Uh, as long as you guys can hear me fine, that's all that matters. Questions can be answered later. But uh, <laughs> if you can't uh, follow exactly what I'm saying when I'm saying it, that would be a bit of a, a bit of a problem. Uh, 
I see. So it's uh, so it's a bit. So I, I'm. I think I'm getting it. That it's a bit hot right there, right <laughs> in the summer. Is that what you're getting at? Because I think that's what you're getting at. It tends to get a bit hot here, here as well, but I think it usually uh, caps at 40 degrees Celsius. There, there have been hotter summers than that when I was little, but the last few years were fairly decent in that regard. Uh, we're getting pretty close to the end of all of this and we're going to get to some uh, more interesting parts. I'm actually going to open Reaper so we have it uh, ready when uh, uh, when 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 when, he, when we check some uh, instruments. I'm actually going to open up a a few of uh, few of the songs I already made because I think I managed to go through every single possible instrument I've talked about so far, and we can uh, see how they sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll update later. Right, so let's see. Open. Uh, I'll check it later. Damn, that hot! Oh, then I see why you don't have daylight savings. Okay. Okay. <coughs> now, before we move, we move on to the fun part. Uh, you know, actually listening to some stuff. Let's see, let's talk a little bit about how in the fudge do you combine all these instruments because that's actually the <laughs> that's actually quite a bit uh, important. Of course, I'm not asking you to remember all of this from the start. Uh, if anyone actually wants this uh, PDF file that I'm using, I'll be glad to send it to you. So, Let's start off with our uh, good friends, the violins. We're going to go through this by category, so it's easier to follow. Uh, the violins actually blend well with woodwinds, especially flutes and piccolos. Uh, what uh, uh, One of the common techniques used here is to actually have a, a flute like the... F uh, God damn it! A woodwind like the flute or piccolo, uh, double the violin in uh, octaves uh, with the flute or piccolo playing an octave higher. It adds, uh, it really reinforces the melody and uh, adds uh, quite a bit of color to your songs. Uh, of course, violins blend well with other stringed or bowed instruments since fr they're from the same family. Uh, you can also encounter uh, what is called as first violins, which are the solo violins mostly, uh, which in an orchestra are obtained by uh, violinists who are uh, the top of their the top of their players, and they often and they often um, have a melody which is which is basically doubling what the second violinists are playing, but uh, the first violin fire first violins are playing it an octave higher. And uh, can also, uh, you can also use the violin uh, to double the viola to mellow the sound of the viola. The violas, of course, uh, blend well with woodwinds as well. Uh, they also blend well with trumpets. They are the um, one of the few string instruments that actually blend well with brass. As you can see, blending the brass with anything is a bit tricky because um, because of their characteristics. And for both violins and uh, violas, when playing pizzicato, you can actually blend well with the harp because uh, the uh, they sound quite similar. 
cellos actually blend well with most instruments since um, since they have a, a tad mellower song uh, sound sorry than uh, violins and violas. Uh, they can be used to double with oboe, clarinet, and bassoon, and with violins and violas, which are playing an octave higher, and uh, pizzicato also blends well with harp. The double bass is... Uh, I don't think I forgot to mention it here, but the double bass is blends well with uh, any and all lower instruments, like uh, bassoon, contrabassoon, and uh, tuba. Now, woodwinds, we actually have to split it into two parts because there's so bloody many of them. So, the piccolo uh, actually blends with flutes and other woodwinds quite well. Uh, it also, the instruments it blends the most with and doubles for the most part is the flute, since from the same family, or violin. Uh, you can double these instruments either in unison or an octave higher. My personal preference is to play them an octave higher for the most part, because I like, I like how they sound. The flute is actually a pretty, pretty chill instrument. It can blend with any, but it usually doubles violin, oboe, or clarinet, and can double with bassoon, uh, with, uh, of course, at one or two octaves apart, usually two. Uh, I think someone mentioned that this adds an exotic effect. I haven't really tested it, so I can't really confirm. The oboe is... Um, uh, is one of the instruments, it's another instrument that blends well with violins and violas and can also double the trumpet which is pretty useful because uh, the trumpet is um, it's a bit of a difficult instrument to blend in from time to time because it has a very unique sound and it kind of overshadows the others the English horn uh, blends well with uh, oboes uh, they're from the same family so it's understandable uh, it can also double other woodwinds an octave lower, usually because it has a lower range. And it can also double the trumpets, and actually blends fairly well with strings. The clarinet is, uh, is again another chill instrument because, as I've said, it's really unobtrusive. It doesn't really stand out, especially in the lower registers. It can also double the flute and oboe. You can uh, people uh, apparently it can double trumpets in unison. I didn't really use that combination that much, so I'm just gonna go with it. I having <laughs> knowing how they sound, I I mean I can see how it may work. I guess it it depends on tastes. Since it has a lower uh, register, it can also double the cello in unison, and it can also double the violins uh, in unison, but it's a bit sketchy, the violins would have to play a bit lower, uh, but usually they, they can double the violins an octave lower. Now, the bass clarinet, the bass clarinet, sorry, blends well with other clarinets, of course, since they're the same family, and uh, other lower woodwinds, like the English horn bassoon and contra bassoon. It can also blend well with horns, cellos, and double bass because of its uh, lower register. The bassoon and contra bassoon are uh, are they're from the same family. They can uh, the bassoon blends well with horns, but it can also double the trombone, tuba, or cellos uh, in unison. But again, depends on what the trombone and the cellos are playing. Uh, make sure it uh, doesn't exceed the range of the bassoon but it can also double it an octave lower which is usually which can usually be the case especially with cellos and trombones for the most part the contrabassoon being uh, the lowest of the woodwinds can double with tuba quite easily can also uh, can also double with double bass and with cellos that are playing an octave higher of course because uh, the range is a bit higher than the contrabassoon uh, now the trumpet can be doubled with uh, oboe, which uh, will make the s the trumpet sound a bit less metallic and less uh, harsh. Can also be doubled with clarinet and horns, and actually blends well with trombones. They're from the same uh, group of instruments. The horn, on the other hand, is a bit mellower, a bit friendlier, uh, as opposed to the trumpet. 
it's actually considered the bridge between the woodwinds and brass section because it can actually blend pretty well with uh, the English horn and other such instruments. They have a, it has a mellower sound and it uh, it can provide a, a subtle a subtle transition between the two. It can also blend with a clarinet and bassoon, and it also blends well with strings. The trombone usually doubles with cellos or double basses and can, can can be combined with the bosun or trumpets. And finally, we have the tuba, which blends well with woodwinds, especially the lower ones, uh, bassoon or contrabassoon to be exact. It can also blend with the horns and trombones, and by horns, of course, I mean the French horn. Uh, it can also double in octaves or in unison with a double bass to reinforce the lower register. The percussions, especially, I'm uh, going to focus on the um, call it the percussions with definite pitch. The timpani is mainly used to double the lowest root uh, root note of chords. I don't know why I described it as the lowest root, but the basically the root note of a chord. You get it, the lowest one. The glockenspiel um, doubles in unison if the range allows it, of course, or octaves, which is more likely to add brightness to the timber. It can be used very effectively with piccolo, flutes, celesta, harps, violins, oboe, clarinet, or piano. Especially in the high registers, it sounds really cool with the piano. The xylophone doubles with the pizzicato strings to reinforce the notes, which is fairly useful because pizzicato strings are not as loud as bowed strings. Uh, so having something that uh, reinforces the note is really useful. It can also double with regular strings in unison or octaves, depending of course on the range of uh, the stringed instrument. The vibraphone can blend well with woodwinds, especially the clarinet and piano. The marimba uh, can be useful for woodwinds and the low strings, but it can also work well with celles or glockenspiel in the higher registers. The tubular bells actually blend well with the glockenspiel and vibraphone and can be used with large brass chords to add a festive or majestic atmosphere as I have alway already mentioned. You can also accomplish that with the glockenspiel as well. And the keyboards finally. The cellist actually blends really well with the harp because of their uh, peaceful like sounds. It can also be used with high strings and high woodwinds. I haven't really got the chance to do that. Uh, mostly used to add color uh, by doubling any instrument you might like in uh, unison or octaves. The piano actually doubles very well with woodwinds, brass or strings, especially in the extreme registers. I can actually vouch for that, especially the strings in extreme registers, because uh, the strings in uh, the higher registers can actually reinforce the higher higher notes of the piano, which, as I've already said, aren't really the loudest of the bunch. Now, song examples. Uh, let's see, any and all questions around here? No, just Ed being uh, extremely happy that we are opening Reaper. That's good to hear. Now, let's see. Uh, you may have noticed or heard something about MIDI during your time as a musician. Uh, MIDI is uh, an acronym for Musical Interface, Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And what it actually looks like, and uh, this is where we get to the good stuff. See this uh, drum kit here, this drum track. Uh, Basically, this is what MIDI looks like. It's a bunch of uh, lines, because that's what they are. Uh, and the, the keyword in this whole thing is digital. Because a MIDI track can either uh, play, play a note or a sound at a certain point, or it cannot. Basically, if it plays, you can see this line here, which lasts as long as you want, and you can actually modify it. And uh, you can see that this is where the notes actually start. And uh, whenever you don't have anything, it's dead silence. It's, it's not even dead silence. There's actually nothing there because no signal or note, quote unquote, is meant to be played there. And since this, and since I have been. Um, 
mentioning a lot about uh, orchestral stuff here. Let's go right here. What the hell did I modify? Whatever. Anyway. Reaper doing a Microsoft Word on me there. So, what's the deal with MIDI? Well, MIDI is actually useful because uh, it allows you to create your own songs on certain instruments without having the instruments on you. How does the MIDI do that? Well, not by itself anyway, because it really can't, because MIDI is basically a bunch of signals that have no real value unless you assign an instrument to them. So, how do you do that, one asks? Well, by using something called a VST. A VST is an acronym for like Virtual Studio Technology and the particular brand of VSTs we're interested in is a VST instrument, which is basically a virtual instrument, uh, meaning that it produces the notes and the sounds of a particular instrument without having the instrument, hence the virtual thing. And uh, the thing about it is that uh, these VSTs, you can actually download them, a bunch of them, for free. And uh, you can actually tell Reaper to, to look for them in certain places. You can do that by going to Options Preferences and uh, in this Edit Path right here, you can see here, I've uh, there are a bunch of paths where it uh, can uh, search for VSTs. Uh, these are the first the first ones are the default ones, and I think I've actually added this one manually because uh, I wanted to keep all my um, all my VSTs in a certain place. So we can, the place is here now. A VST is uh, basically what you want to do when using Reaper and anything in general is to look for VSTs that are in this with this particular extension especially if you're on Windows the DLL thingy as someone who has coded in C Sharp I know very well what a DLL is it's basically a sort of an application but not really an executable one but it contains a bunch of code inside it that uh, does things in our case the code for it which is compiled into that DLL file, is used to produce uh, to produce the the actual instrument sound. How that happens is largely do, is largely dependent on the on the VST itself. You can have uh, VST instruments based entirely on samples, which I avoid because contact uh, written with K's is a thing and I don't want to get accustomed to that thing. Ed might know a little bit more about this. And um, uh, and there are other ones that actually produce the sound in a somewhat synthetic manner. I mean, they, they have some bass samples, which they use to create the sounds, but they don't use only samples. They can actually generate uh, higher or lower notes based on... Uh, based on a few samples that they receive as input. Now, let's uh, take a let's uh, do ourselves a favor and uh, listen to to some to some instruments to see how they function. So, as you can see, I have a bunch of different uh, instruments in this uh, cover. Let's go home. And uh, for starters, let's start. Uh, let's start playing the violin to have uh, to see how it sounds. And this is the violin uh, as it sounds by itself. Let's see the difference between it and the viola. The viola is, of course, uh, 
playing the notes an octave lower, but notice how it sounds a bit harsher. Let's move on to the cellos, uh, if I can find them. Ah, here they are. Notice that the sound is a bit... Uh, it's fuller, I'll give it that, and it's uh, way mellower than the viola. And uh, finally, let's move on to the double bass, or I named it contrabass because that's how I pronounce it in Romanian. Kind of like contrabassoon, but yeah. Notice the menacing sound of it. Now everything blended together will give us this and the demonetization from YouTube, but what can you do? Any questions so far? Right, so I must be either the best teacher in the world or YouTube's, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, uh, delay is... Uh, ah, okay, Ed. Oh, we'll get to drums or timpani in uh, just a bit. Yeah, thank you for the feedback, guys. Now, uh... Ah, why not? Let's take a uh, listen to the piano. I think uh, it's one of the most common ones, but uh, why not? This is the piano. And also this one. To hear the lower registers as well. how I said you have to be careful with the lower note volumes because they tend to over overpower the higher notes if you're not careful right and uh, let's see what do we have here we actually have uh, a place where um, actually use the timpani here if I can remember where it's uh, quite a small uh, song right nothing out of the ordinary here uh here is a timpani and uh, here's how it sounds for some reason the sonatina vesete that i'm using i don't think it actually has a non-drum roll play or i didn't uh, check for it uh no it basically has only this so it automatically drum rolls it for me but it'd be like that sometimes 
So let's hear it in isolation. Trouble is with drum rolls is that uh, the whole idea of uh, drums that produce notes kind of gets lost in lost in translation or in the mix because being so many drums there, it, you know what I mean. Okay, so now uh, let's move on to something a bit more spicy. Notice how well, we have a violin and uh, a flute here, which surprise, surprise, maybe they're playing the same notes, maybe not. Let's check. Actually, have the violin doubled here. I, <laughs> it's been so long since I did this. I forgot what I was doing here. Let's let's check the violins. Okay, so the violins are playing the same note. I think I doubled it for uh, added uh, volume. So let's hear this section with only the violin. Okay, and now let's hear. Let's see how the flute handles it. And now, magic. I know. I just found that it uh, ad actually adds so much value when you when you use these doublings correctly. Uh, I don't think I'm using a piccolo in this one. I'm using clarinets, though. Uh, as you can see, it's a very small song, right? Okay. So, uh, I also mentioned uh, and uh, blabbed about how I was using the harp in this uh, whole thing. Before we move on to the harp, let's take a bit of a look at that glockenspiel sound, so you know what I'm referring to. Let's uh, put it a bit here. Uh, actually, let me start a bit uh, from here. As you can see, it, uh, the glockenspiel can be used to great effect to reinforce the melody of the song without, uh, being, without it being too intrusive. It also catches the, the listener's ear because of its bright sound. Sure, it might not be a very festive uh, way of using it in this particular uh, song, but you know what I mean. Now, uh, I do believe in the low section is where the harp starts yep let's take a look at the uh, a listen rather to the harp and yeah I actually have two harps in this one because I can also notice notice how it's doubled Let's take a look at uh, take a listen to this one again, but in uh, isolation. Oh, here. This is the harp by itself, and some of you with a keen ear may have also realized that there was something else here that was actually doubling it. A celesta. Let's take a listen to it in isolation. Notice how it kind of sounds like a glockenspiel, but a tad mellower. Also, I think I've uh, exceeded the range because I could hear some dead silence there, but live and learn, I guess. how even though it's subtle it adds so much to it okay now it's time to move on to the brass section because yep we have brass here because why not right so if I remember correctly 
it should start about here yep this is where it starts so the first one we actually encounter is the contra bassoon uh, let's listen to them Now do I realize this kind of gives me a Pirates of the Caribbean vibe for some reason. I also have a second one. It's actually a chord-like thing done with contrabassoons here. And a bit later on we also add a second layer to this a tuba or two and all this correspondence basically this uh, tuba here will double the contra bassoon here and this tuba here is going to double this one here as you can see the notes are basically the same and let's listen to them in entirely Okay, let's see. There are some questions here. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, Ed. So uh, the piano part. Yeah, the velocity power. I think it can be done in the. I haven't really done it. I uh, usually will control it via the volume knob uh, for the track. But I think if you open the VST for it, uh, it should have a, a velocity curve. And uh, a volume which you can use to, which you can use to uh, <coughs> sort of uh, control the volume of it. I usually just use the volume now because I like uh, I like how this sounds uh, on the default. But you can you can actually create uh, and handle very different things here. The VST for this one is called Keyzone Classic. Uh, it's actually a very very good uh, piano. Uh, piano VST one of the best I could find and it's free it's uh, really cool okay so we have just started the bass uh, uh, blah, blah, the brass section sorry and let's move on here when we we introduce another new brass instrument called the bassoon this time Notice how it sounds very similar to the contrabassoon. And also here we finally reach the clarinet. But oh wait, it's going to be doubled by something else. But let's see the clarinet first. Another, uh, and as I mentioned, that the clarinet uh, becomes a bit more um, sturdy, so to speak, in its higher registers. You can actually hear this quite well here. As I said, it's still unobtrusive, but at least it has a bit of a, a bit of more spike, so to speak, uh, to it. And uh, I actually double the clarinet with two things here. The more you know, I guess, uh, the, and the more you remember. And we have a French horn or two. We also have another uh, nifty little thing here 
oh, what am I doing to myself? So let's solo this one, solo the clarinet. We also have the horns 3 and 4, which are here. And we also have another thing that uh, doubles it, our very own xylophone. Listen to how it sounds with all of these. And uh, let's take a look at, uh, listen rather, to the xylophone in isolation to see exactly its unaltered sound. And we're almost done. Uh, another inst another little instrument or a large one we introduce here is the trumpet, which uh, takes care of uh, the lead guitar in the original song, actually. But wait, those of you who have a keen eye will also have noticed that we have something that seems to be eerily familiar in the horn section here. And yep, I actually did uh, double the trumpet with the horn so it has a, a slightly mellower sound. And yeah, I think that basically covers just about the whole range of the instruments that uh, I could possibly think of to talk and use. I'm actually, I, I only now realize that actually, I think I've used every single last one of these in this uh, song. Oh yeah, oh, and also the chimes here. The chimes is uh, another, another name used for, um, uh, whatchamacallit, for tubular bells. So let's see how they sound. Okay, to be fair, it sounds a, a bit more awesome in my Coldfields version, but don't ha don't at me. And uh, with all of this, uh, when o with all of these powers combined, it should sound something like this. So they're there to reinforce the the sort of chord that starts there. And uh, yeah, I think that about covers it. There's literally not a single instrument aside from the marimba and the vibraphone, I think. But I couldn't find either a, a VST for them or a use for them or both. So yeah, th this is literally the <laughs> those are literally the only two that I couldn't uh, find a way to use in any of my songs so far. So I think that about covers it from what I from my what I want to do. And uh, uh, yeah, now if you have any questions, I'm uh, here for them. Knows that Ed uh, Ed has asked uh, something here. Yeah, with regards to accent of notes, I think you can also control that from the knobs that you have see, uh, that I've shown you. I didn't really, didn't really uh, put too much thought into that because I could uh, get what I w I could get what I want if I could speak with uh, using only the volume. And uh, as to estimate how a real pianist would play it, I'd w I would say uh, no. Ish. I mean, 
it depends uh, when it comes to linking notes and uh, playing them one after the other it does a pretty good job I'll uh, I'll give it that uh, the only thing that uh, you can't really control directly from the VST anyway is uh, intonation and the uh, volume markers I mean you have to do it via the volume uh, uh, the volume t ah god damn it I close Reaper um, let's see let's see to show you exactly what I mean it uh, actually does a pretty good job overall uh, when it comes to knowing uh, see when you're playing piano it's uh, a bit of a um, a bit of a doozy at times uh, because when you when you are playing notes like one after the other the, you're supposed to like sort of play it with a fade out kind of thing so when you're like doing do 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 it actually does a pretty good job at doing the fade out part of it uh, and the volume thing that the volume uh, controls that I was talking about uh, you can actually obtain it by selecting a track and pressing the V button in Reaper and it will open this and you can uh, create certain dots and uh, adjust the volume between those two dots and so on it takes a bit of um, it takes a bit of work I'm not gonna lie but you can usually get the job done using only the volume So I'm here if you uh, if you have any other questions. I'm gonna wait for like two or three minutes uh, to capture any delays. Oh God, I have no voice anymore. It's kind of weird having all this dead air between uh, uh, between waiting for you to ask questions and uh, answering them. Kind of feels like that one scene in Batman and Robin, which I don't exactly know why they left in the final cut of the movie, but you know, it's actually a dead air scene. Okay, thanks for the compliments, Carlos. Much appreciated. Okay then, uh, I've, s I've seen uh, no other questions. I'm going to wait for a bit until I close this up. Ah, <laughs> oh, hey there, Victor. 
much appreciated as well. Well, if you're going to listen to that, then I must have been I've done something, right? Okay then, guys. Thank you for uh, taking your time to be here. If you have any questions, you can hit me up on the Syngate website. The, well, the those of you who have an account there, or you know, on YouTube, you can send messages. You know how this works. Uh, I'm going to end the stream now. Uh, hopefully, go get my voice replaced somehow. I don't know. I'll figure something out. And. As Goku says, until we meet again, I wish you a pleasant day or night, wherever you are, and talk to you later.